What's up, everybody? You're watching NASA in Silicon Valley Live for October 25th, 2018. I'm your host, Danielle Carmichael. And if you don't know NASA in Silicon Valley Live, it's a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center with the various scientists, researchers, engineers, and all-around cool people at NASA, where we talk about all the nerdy news that you need to know about. And I'm here with my co-host, Abby. Hey, thanks, Danielle. Hi, I'm Abby Tabor. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. Um, I wanted to tell everybody that you can watch us in a bunch of different places. So we are simultaneously live on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. But if you want to participate in the chat, you need to join us on Twitch. So that's twitch.tv slash NASA. But if you miss us live, that's okay, because we'll have the video on demand later, including on NASA TV. And if you prefer your new nerdy NASA news all audio, you can join us on the podcast. You can find the audio version later on podcast services throughout the solar system and beyond. <laughs> so, Danielle, why don't you tell them what we're up to today? It's a little bit different this time. That's right. So we're actually going to be holding our first ever Halloween costume and cosplay contest. Yeah, NASA-inspired costume and cosplay contest. So if you're a NASA fan and like me, you failed to get a Halloween costume together before now, you're in luck because we're going to show you a bunch of NASA inspired looks and we're going to brainstorm how you could recreate those looks at home. So, so if you do end up using any of these looks or you wear any of our space themed costumes for Halloween, we want to see it. So you can share your NASA inspired costumes with us on social media using the hashtag NASA costume. So Abby, what are you wearing? All right. So you might remember NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, right? So Kepler is a mission that we led here at Ames um, and it is that space telescope that is out there finding planets. So it's been staring at stars around the galaxy, finding other planets circling other stars besides our sun, exoplanets. So what I am is I got a little Kepler here and I've got my star field and I am the concept of Kepler's discovery of other worlds. Okay. What about you? Uh, so I am dressed up as the legendary flight director, Gene Krantz. Nice. So, so remind uh, us about him. So he actually helped write the go-no-go no go procedures that we still use today that allows missions to determine if they're going to be go as planned or if they're aborted. And okay. also uh, as flight director during Apollo 13, him and his team actually helped the astronauts safely return back to Earth. Wow, that one, Apollo 13. It was nothing cool. less amazing. Nothing, nothing. He's also famously uh, attributed to the quote, failure is not an option, but fun fact, that actually was not him. Oh, for real? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he gets credit for it, but no. He does. He Interesting. does. Interesting. All right. Well, you want to see some more NASA looks? Yeah, let's Should go get into for it? it. Let's go for it. All right. All right. So we're going to head into our first category which is called Everyday NASA Looks. So these are outfits you'd see our researchers wearing in the lab or out in the field and around the center when they're doing their research. So leave your comments in the chat if you like what you see or you have any questions. And let's welcome our first guest to the set. Come on out, Egla. Hey! hey. hey. <laughs> Look at you. Nice. Come on up here. Come on and join us. <laughs> you look amazing. <laughs> welcome. Hey welcome. Hey. So let's start off by telling us what's your name and what you do here at Ames. So my name is Agli Chakanavichute. I am a contractor scientist in the radiation biophysics lab nice. at uh, Space Biosciences Division here at Ames. Okay. And I study the damage that is done by space radiation to the human body and what determines sensitivity to radiation. Okay. okay. So what's going on with your costume that you have here? It's uh, pretty interesting. Right. So I'm wearing your standard lab costume for working with uh, some sort of more sensitive or dangerous samples such as human blood okay. because this is what we work on. We're collecting cells from lots of healthy people, yep. okay. exposing them to simulated space radiation because we can't fly them to the moon or Mars yet, so we have to simulate those conditions here on Earth. All right. And then we're studying what happens to these cells. Okay. 
finding out that different people have very different sensitivity. Okay, In response to the same amount of radiation, the same dose, some people will have, you know, 20% of their cells die. Other people may have 60% of their cells ah, die. Right. Okay. Now, the question is, what determines that? And can we find it out and then tap into it yeah. to develop uh, countermeasures, basically therapies okay. to improve okay. yeah. Yeah. sensitivity? Yeah. So this is what you wear. It's fabulous. When you are working with blood samples in the lab, goggles, white coat, gloves, obviously, very clean gloves, not taken from the lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's if you're fresh not air. in the hood, you're wearing this mask. Fabulous. But it's very hard to speak in it. So. Okay. <laughs> I already have a quick question for you. Do you love your job? Of course I love my job. <laughs> Who wouldn't? It looks that way. Yeah. <laughs> kind of feeling. <laughs> Fantastic. So if our viewers at home wanted to recreate your outfit, like what could what could we do? Well, this outfit is so boring compared to a lot of others. I mean, it's not even a space suit. It's not a well, flight suit. Well, you true. go to a doctor's office or you go to cleaning supplies and get your gloves on. Okay. Try to find some glasses to serve as goggles. And you know, something like this hat or the mask, you can just make it yourself. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Egla. It has been a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, we'll we'll see you a bit later because we, we, we got to see much. the other contenders, <laughs> and we'll bring you back out in a bit. Thank Excellent. You. Okay, and up next, uh, I would like to welcome our next guests, uh, Caroline and Emma. Why don't you guys come on out? Oh man! Oh, I have not seen these before. This is awesome. <laughs> Ladies, you rule. <laughs> Ladies, why don't you please come join us? So cool. Oh my god, I was pretty happy with my t-shirt with some stars glued on it. <laughs> I'm sure you guys walked in. I'm a huge fan. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, first things first, can you ladies please introduce yourselves and tell us what you do here at Ames? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll start. I'm Caroline Parworth. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at NASA Ames. And I work on the Alpha Jet Atmospheric Experiment, also mm -hmm. known as AJAX. AJAX. And uh, we use a research aircraft to take measurements of gases in the western U.S. Okay. So some of those gases may include greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Okay. Um, also, gases that can influence air quality, health, oh, yeah. so ozone and formaldehyde. Okay. 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 So air pollution stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and we take these measurements... So we can validate Earth observing satellites and yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. What about you? I'm Emma Yates. I'm a research scientist also working with Ajax. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess uh, part of our job is to wear a flight suit and to fly in the aircraft and act as the in flight scientist. But most of the time, we are in the lab working with our instruments, mm -hmm. making sure that they are taking measurements accurately, mm -hmm. and also analyzing data okay, behind well, a computer. You know, cool. I think we have a photo of you guys. So, Bill, can we get that brought up on screen? Okay, that's me, the full flight. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I just want to mention that we have a, a call here for Emma and Caroline to do a female remake of Top Gun. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that idea. I like that. It looks pretty cool. Now, right? We definitely play beach needs volleyball to be done. on campus, on base. So. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Are you guys at such a high altitude that you need these? Helmets and masks? Yeah, it's, that a what bit, it's, for? it's a bit hard to breathe in the aircraft, yeah. so, you know, to deliver oxygen while... We, we've flown, uh, the aircraft's flown to 40,000 feet with our instruments on board, wow. but typically we're around 28,000 feet, that's oh, wow. um, eight or nine okay. kilometers. so are you guys actually flying the planes, or do you have a pilot? <laughs> we have a pilot. Yeah. It, okay. In the last picture you saw, there's two two seats. Okay. Yeah. So a pilot in the front, and then a, a scientist in the back seat, okay. which okay. we turn our instruments on and off and make observations about mm -hmm. the atmosphere and things that might be useful for analyzing data. Okay. Sometimes we tell the pilots, maybe go down that route, you know, we oh, yeah. yeah, it depends, but we can yeah. give them some guidance on yeah. what works. Okay. Yeah. So, I have a question. Oh, it looks like Abby has a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does NASA develop the sensors used in these tests or are they outsourced? A mixture of both. Yeah. Yeah, so we have the the greenhouse gas instrument is, is outsourced, um, but the meteorological measurement system was in-house at Ames, and the formaldehyde system we have was built um, by some researchers in Goddard. 
yeah, yeah. Space a space mixture of center. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your costumes. Well, not really costumes because you actually wear that, but yeah. uh, what do we have going on over here? Um, it's your standard flight suit. Yes. Um, with lots of pockets. Okay. Badge. Um, it's fireproof, I guess. So, Helmet. Um, with the visor and a breathing mask. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's yeah. pretty sunny up there, so we use the visors a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what do you guys put in these pockets? Yeah, like, you've got I'm a sure. lot of zippered pockets. Oh, yeah. There's a lot zippered of pockets. pockets. So, Never enough. <laughs> if we're in the back seat, we want to take notes about timing of things. And so, I usually keep a lot of pens there because. Oh. It's pretty turbulent up there, and you can lose pens and things like that. So okay. it's great just to hold your phone as well as, like, pens. Yeah. You know, <laughs> speaking of phones, I think, hey, Bill, can we bring up this photo that we have? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, is that a selfie? <laughs> that's a selfie I took of myself on a yeah, recent air um, flight in the wintertime, I think, last year. You are so, so cool. <laughs> so pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. You always got to do it for the gram even when yes. you're working. Yes. <laughs> On that note, I have a comment. Carol Danvers, a Marvel <laughs> reference. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if our viewers at home wanted to go ahead and recreate this look, what would we need? I think you need to go down to Home Depot or wherever and get your coveralls. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your hardware and store might have those. Yeah, yeah. like a painter suit or something of the sort. And yeah. then a helmet. Maybe make your own visor or a mask. You can get creative mm-hmm. with that. And make some badges. Make some NASA. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mission make badges. Mm-hmm. Cool. That sounds doable. Yeah. yeah. And that's going to be one of the coolest, I suspect. But I haven't seen you these haven't, costumes yeah. yet, yeah. so <laughs> I don't know what awaits us. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> So cool, you guys. All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. We'll we'll bring you back in a little bit. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Did stuff. you know that they were this cool? Have you um, met these ladies before? Actually, yes. I must yeah. admit, we have gotten to meet earlier, so I was pretty psyched for their costumes. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. All right. So, up next, we have flight planner Ken Bauer. Ooh. So, if Ken is ready, why don't you come on out? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh nice. nice. We've got a leather jacket. We've got some coveralls with a bunch of badges. I like that. Nice. nice. Come on well, up. Come on down, Ken. <laughs> Good afternoon, Danielle. Abby. Welcome. How are you? So, nice. like, we started off with our other guests. Uh, what is your name, and what do you do here at Ames? My name is Ken Bauer, and mm-hmm. I plan science missions for NASA's Airborne Observatory. Okay. It's named SOFIA, which mm-hmm. is an acronym for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Okay. Right. Okay. Another high-flying researcher and costume. Yeah. Yes, quite okay. high. Yeah, up in the stratosphere. So, awesome. if you could break it down in one sentence, what would it be? Sophia? Yeah. So uh, most of the time we take telescopes and we put them on top of mountains so there's no clouds and less smog and stuff in the way. Mm -hmm. That's not high enough if you wanted to do infrared astronomy. So what we do instead is we put it inside a jumbo jet. We're flying in an old Pan Am Airlines 747, a repurposed tool, and we fly to 45,000 feet sometimes. So we're three times as high as all the ground-based observatories. Oh, wow. wow. Three and times. from that, you can do infrared astronomy. Okay, so, so let's back up a little further. Sure. What is infrared astronomy? So there's lots of kinds of light, okay? We we're used to lots of colors that we can see with our eyes. Mm-hmm. That's only a small fraction of all the light there is. That's visible light. Okay. There's also yeah. infrared light, ultraviolet light, X-rays, radio, okay. gamma rays, microwaves, all these other things. They all make part of the spectrum. As humans, we've been doing astronomy with our eyes as our instruments by Mm -hmm. looking at the sky for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. But we've been looking at this tiny sliver of all the light that is available. Mm, Wow. So only in the last century have we been able to build more tools that can look up and see the sky with new kinds of eyes. Okay. Unfortunately, if you look up with infrared eyes, you will look up and every night, everywhere on Earth, it will be cloudy and overcast. You'll never be able to see anything. Aww. You have to, It's the water vapor. Okay. The water oh, is the killer. Yeah. So you have to get above the moist air that we live in and go up to the dry air in the stratosphere, and then you're high enough to do oh, infrared yeah. astronomy. Okay. Who knew? Well, you yeah. know, I think we have a video sure. yes. of Sophia. Can we go ahead and get that brought up? So here we are taking off from our usual operations base in Palmdale, California. And I said it's a 747. It's going to get up pretty high, and here we have opened that big garage door. So we did something that uh, Boeing never wanted to have happen to one of their airplanes. We cut a 16-foot-wide <laughs> hole in the airplane, mounted a garage door that rotates out of the way, and then there's a 10-foot diameter telescope inside 
and we point that up at the sky. Uh, right now, the telescope's covered. You can't quite see it because the day, the sun is out, okay. but we only fly at night. Okay, okay. Right. I suppose so, that makes sense, but yes. I wouldn't have thought of it. We fly uh, all night. Nice. Now, I have three questions that are kind of Great. all on a similar topic. One was meant for Emma and Caroline. What about the gravity force when you fly? Maybe that's relevant. And so others are asking, is it not too shaky on a plane to do astronomy? And how do you mitigate the vibrations? Okay, all, oh, all related, related, right? So that's yeah. fine. Uh, a 747 is not a high-performance fighter jet. That is true. Uh, it's only pulling 1.2, 1.3 Gs. No, nothing significant for us. So okay. that is not a big issue in, inside Sophia when we're flying around. But great question. If you've ever just looked up with with your own binoculars trying mm -hmm. to look at Saturn or something, the thing's jumping all over the place. Mm -hmm. Well, it's you. You're the one that's not able to hold yeah. your binoculars still enough. Yeah. So you want your telescope to be very stable and solid, and putting it on a moving platform like an aircraft that does this and does this all the time doesn't seem to work. Well, okay. we built a really good telescope, and we're in an international partnership. It's not just NASA, the United States. It's also the German Aerospace uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Agency that's working with us, and uh, they built a fantastic telescope. And when we're on board that plane and people are looking at the output of the camera, it looks like a still shot. It, you can't tell that the plane is moving. And really? yet I can be in the plane watching things happen and the telescope is moving all wow. over the place. So That's it's cool. beautifully stabilized. Uh, so the, the answer is good tools. Good oh, tools. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, where exactly do you guys fly? Uh, we can fly all over. We're the world's largest transportable telescope. Most <laughs> okay. of the time we fly out of Southern California, right. and, uh, but we've deployed to different places. When, when an event happens, like last year's eclipse, you need to be where it happens in order to see it. Right, that is and true. Uh, we've several times captured events that you have to be at exactly the right spot. Those are called occultations, so that's okay. a shadow of Pluto or Triton falling on the Earth. Okay. And so we've deployed to different places in order to fly our missions. And every summer, we try to do something that you can never do from California, and that is to see the southern skies. So we will relocate our base of operations for two months to Christchurch, New Zealand. Okay. So the yeah. Earth is a big sphere. We live up here, so mm -hmm. we can always see these stars, and sometimes right. we can see these stars, mm -hmm. and sometimes we can see these stars. We can never see these stars. Never. Unless so we you go relocate down, there, yeah. down to here yeah. so that we can see these stars. That's pretty cool. Very cool. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to squeeze them in there. Well, how often do you go up on Sophia? Uh, I don't fly that often. I mostly plan missions. Uh, I'm a backup mission director when they need somebody extra. Uh, so I've flown about 40 missions over seven years. Uh, we have people that have flown as many as 200 missions. Mm -hmm. We flew last night. We are flying oh, yeah. tonight. We are flying tomorrow night. Okay. Go to, f go to uh, your favorite aviation website and put in the tail number NASA 747, and you can find us taking off tonight around sunset ah, and right. flying around ah, for 10 hours. Great. That's people pretty cool. Track these things. Cool. Um, one person was checking, is it a radio telescope? And I think it's... It is not it's, it's a radio realistic. telescope. It, it, it looks it's, like a, a visible telescope, but it has the right coatings and the right optics so that it works for both uh, visible and infrared. All right. Okay. But we can um, go out to about a millimeter on a good day. Mm -hmm. it, it, for the science nerds know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so if our users at home or our viewers at home wanted to recreate your look, mm -hmm. What would they make, what would they need to do? Uh, mostly, it's not that hard. So go to uh, your favorite hardware store and buy yourself a painter's smock or something like that, uh, and then yeah. go find some great images. So go to NASA.gov, download pictures of the meatballs or things like that, and make them big and bright and staple them all over your uniform. Yeah. Uh, you'll have a hard time finding this one. This one's kind of my favorite. This is the okay. Sophia Mission Operations. So Sophia yeah. Mops. Sophia Mops. Sophia Mops. <laughs> That's the coolest. <laughs> so, a couple final shout outs for you, Ken. Yes. Uh, Flyover TwitchCon. That's okay. coming up. People want to see you. And Ken, that man is hot. <laughs> Ken, Ken looks the coolest so far, for sure. So, you got a couple votes there. Well, thank Hooray. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Abby. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you. That are filling in. Uh, make sure you guys vote for your, fam uh, your favorite costumes. And don't forget if you guys do use any of these looks or wear any space themed costumes, make sure you tag us on social media with the hashtag NASA Costumes. Excellent. All right. Who is up next, Danielle? Um, I think we have Ted and Christina. So you guys go come ahead and come on out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the choreography. Nice. Well, welcome.
welcome, welcome. <laughs> Those are some uh, pretty interesting stashes that you got going on over there. Yes, yes, yes. I haven't seen Thank you guys you. in a while. I didn't, I didn't know you'd grown this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Welcome. So what is going on here? <laughs> well, well we're, we're here to represent the wind tunnels and to okay. talk a little bit about what we do and show you what we wear in a yeah. typical work day. Okay, so <laughs> first let's introduce ourselves so you guys can be familiar with the audience. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm Ted Garbeff. I'm an instrumentation engineer um, in our wind tunnels here at Ames Research Center. Uh, my name is Christina No. I'm also an instrumentation engineer in wind tunnel systems. Um, we do a lot of more structural dynamics, and we both do image analysis. All right. Okay, so yeah. you guys mentioned wind tunnels. Yeah. Like, what are those? Oh, yeah. Like, why do we use them? Yeah, well, uh, the first day in NASA, right, is aeronautics. And That's so true. NASA has these cool ideas for new kinds of airplanes and rockets and stuff. And before you build the real thing, you want to test out your idea without building, like, the full-scale thing. Okay. And that's what we use wind tunnels for. Um, and incidentally, you know, I said rockets and wind tunnels. You might think, oh, rockets are in space. There's no air in space. But the hardest <laughs> yeah. thing about <laughs> building a rocket is getting through the air to get to space. Okay. So okay. we do a lot of testing rockets yeah. in the wind tunnels. All right. And here at Ames, we have some really cool wind tunnels. We've got the biggest wind tunnel in the world, okay. the National Full Scale Aerodynamics Complex. It's 80 by 120 feet wide test section, so you can fit full-size aircraft in it. Um, it's ridiculously it's huge. Yeah. We also have really fast wind tunnels. We have the unitary plan wind tunnel, which can go up to Mach two and a half and two atmospheres of pressure and do you lots know, of different things. I think we have yeah. a photo of I think I think this is the unitary plan. Can we go ahead and bring that up on the screen? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Christina can talk about that. So uh when some of the techniques we use it is actually image image processing and we use a uh, very nice neon pink paint and one of what this paint does is uh it's pressure sensitive so we illuminate with uv lights okay and uh, depending on how much it's illuminated it's actually proportional to pressure so right, a lot right. of the times um you could see little tiny ports you see little black dots on, on the model so you're measuring pressures yep. but okay but uh, with our imaging technique basically every single pixel is a pressure measurement so you're basically measuring millions yeah. of pressures on the surface of okay. the model because the paint is like a sensor right exactly the yeah. paint is a sensor it's reacting to the air pressure i got to write about this once it was very <laughs> <exciting>. <laughs> yeah so um, like the, the air is blasting against that model and you can measure the pressure that's hitting it yeah right? so the, yeah. the the paint actually gets quenched by oxygen um oh. and depends how much oxygen is on there that that's how much the paint is illuminated, which okay. is how we get the pressures. All right. Yeah. That's so pretty cool. A zillion yeah. little points. Super cool. What, what was that model? Oh, that was a space launch system, which okay. is uh, one of the, the new big rockets NASA is working on. Okay. That's um, actually, that's pretty yeah. cool. You guys get to... Yeah. We also, we also like support commercial space a lot. So we work with Boeing and SpaceX, you know, and Launch Alliance. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything commercial crew related to. Okay. Right, cool. A lot of different things. I got some questions and comments like, that's so cool. <laughs> I don't know what they were referring to, but it's all cool. Yeah. Um, I bet wind tunnels are super fun to mess around with. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, it's fun, but it's definitely like... You know, a dangerous work area. Like yeah, is that, else. It's is that why you vessel. guys got these? Uh, yeah, oftentimes cool you're getting, on. you know, there's lots of, you know, hydraulic fluid and. Yeah, things we have to install, like the, the paint is, isn't very safe either to the skin, so mm -hmm. we kind of have very ready suits to make sure we get, every, you know, safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes we're using really bright light sources, lasers or ultraviolet lights, so. Wearing eye protection. Okay. Is so, uh, if we want to do this at home, what would you might what might you suggest for our costume ideas? Well, uh, I think going to the home improvement store for us too, getting a nice uh, paint suit. Yeah, it helps to roll around in like a puddle of oil though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> an authentic yeah. touch. And you yeah. have to have a mustache where you work. It's, well, yeah. Speaking of that, I have a question, Ted, Christina, how can I grow a mustache like that? <laughs> oh. Uh, broccoli. Broccoli, yes. yes. It's all about yeah, diet. Yeah. 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 I'd like uh, to point out the glasses. Yes. You can pick up wherever you pick up your high powered laser. Okay. Oh, all right. While there. you're there, uh -huh. you can get the glasses. And be sure to get some eye yeah. protection. Yeah. I have a couple of quick questions about your education. What training and education did you need to do what you do? And related, does NASA like electrical engineers or mechanical engineers with a focus in aerospace more? Uh, which might be a better path to do what you do. So far, our branch, actually, we have uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and aerospace engineers. Um, I might say as a mechanical engineer, but I concentrate more in uh, aerodynamics. Okay. And I think yeah, I'm an aerospace engineer. Um, but yeah, a lot of what we do is um, you know, related to electrical and mechanical 
Um, yeah, so it's not so much, you know, specific to, like, having that right degree. It's more of, like, you know, having the background and the interest in the kinds mm -hmm. of things that we do. Okay. okay. Can I squeeze in a few more? I think wow. we have time. I, I think we do. We can in, do one more question okay. for you guys. Okay. In the wind tunnel, hot or cold air? Do you use only cold air or also warm air is the question. That's, that's a yeah. very good question. So we we, uh, we use just air that we get from the outside. So it could okay. be hot or cold, but that uh, actually changes some of our variables depending on if it's a humid day or not humid day. Oh, uh, yeah. There's other tunnels that uses like a refrigerant, R134A, to get a higher density just so you could have different huh. flow phenomenon. So you could use any kind of really fluids uh, depending on the oh, tunnel. Wow, you can control And, and like, yeah, just like... For reference, like the total temperature in our tunnel, like varies between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 100. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the range. All right, what. very cool. Interesting. Well, well thank you, Ted yeah. and Christina. It has been a pleasure. Yeah, um, we'll see you right back see, out. We here are in a because moment. we're going to go into our voting. Yeah, so you guys can head so, backstage, and then we're going to call you back out one by one for voting. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Guys. So uh, let's go ahead and bring back out all of our contestants so that we can vote on the best costume. Yeah. And people watching, you can leave your votes in the chat. We'll uh, see about that. Egla, okay. Caroline, Emma. Okay. <laughs> Here they all are. So up first, we have Egla. Give us another another look at that fine outfit. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay, up next we've got Caroline and Emma in their Ajax flight suits. Heck yeah! <laughs> up next we've got Ken. High flying Ken <laughs> from NASA's Flying Telescope. And last but not least, we've got Ted and Christina. And their mustaches, <laughs> also contending for the prize. All right. You guys ready? I think they are. Dun, 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 dun. The winner is Ken. It's Ken <laughs> from Sophia. Nice. Congratulations, Ken. You guys all look amazing. You guys do. Well, thank you guys for coming on our yeah. show. Yeah. Everybody take one last look before you head to the hardware store where most of these outfits are coming from. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's been great. And so for our viewers at home, don't forget, if you guys do end up using some of these uh, looks or any space-inspired costumes, we'd love to see them. So on our... You can go ahead and tag us on our social media channels uh, using the hashtag NASA costume. Um, Abby, like, what's going on over here? I see a slight change in your costume. <gasps> That's right. I discovered planets. I'm Kepler, and I discovered a whole bunch of new planets. I've got this giant Jupiter-like planet, and maybe this is a water world. And it's just so exciting because Kepler discovered thousands of exoplanets out there. Some were oceans of molten lava and some were like supersized earths covered in oceans themselves oceans of water or other liquids and these are just some examples of those exciting finds okay well that's actually pretty cool Thanks. so we're going to move into our next category it's going to be vintage nasa outfits Excellent. so these are nasa inspired looks from different decades so let's go ahead and bring out our guests to the set come on out april and Lynn. Lane. Here they come. Nice. Hey, April and Lane. Your hair is lovely today. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Come on out. <laughs> you, you got some explaining to do. Come on up here. <laughs> so, uh, please introduce yourselves and tell you and tell us, uh, tell our viewers, like, what you do here at Ames, and also, what is your costume that you guys are rocking today? Hey, well, I'm Lane Carafantis. I'm the center historian, and um, this is the costume I wear every day. I am dressed as an historian. <laughs> I have the corduroy blazer with a lapel pen, and generally covered in cat hair. Um, <laughs> this is about how historians have looked for a very long time. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> 
Um, and my name is April Gage. I'm the center's senior archivist and artifacts ma manager. Awesome. And um, yeah, I manage uh, historical assets for the center mm -hmm. um, that represent um, our capabilities and our people and make them accessible to researchers and the public. Very cool. I'm sure you see a lot of cool things in there. I NASA do. archives, yeah. <laughs> so you've got a funky look going on today. Okay, so um, as you can see, I'm an archivist <laughs> and we actually do wear lab coats okay. um, when we're working on preservation activities, <laughs> preserving artifacts, working with um, preserving photographs or documents. I see. Okay. We also do um, wear the lab coats when we're working with um, biological samples. We actually uh, do have a do sample that. archive here at okay. Ames as well. Oh, wow. I would never have guessed biological samples. Cool. Okay, so what's the difference between an archivist and a historian? Because they seem like two sides of the same coin. They are very similar professions, and in, in fact, some archivists are historians. They have multiple degrees. Okay. But if you want to like sort of draw an easy distinction, um, I would say, and you know, as an archivist here, I really focus on trying to build an evidence base um, that represents, you know, sort of primary sources and unique yeah. items mm -hmm. that represent our capabilities and our okay. history. Really documenting um, and I don't, all that. Yeah, history, I research yeah. and I, I do document, but I don't try to interpret, mm -hmm. and I really try to focus on building that base. Cool. Okay. And it wouldn't be without this type of base that I would be able to to do my research. So. On behalf of all historians, uh, thank you to all archivists. Uh, <laughs> nice. That's pretty I, cool. I bet there are people out there saying historians and archivists work at NASA. So that's cool <laughs> for people to discover, right? Okay. Yeah. So let's go ahead and bring up our first uh, vintage photo from the Ames archive. Can we go ahead and get that brought up on screen? There it is. Right. What, is <laughs> what is going on here? So uh, Ames has a long history of simulation research and also high-end uh, high computing, so it made sense that our early efforts in virtual reality would be going on here. This is from the uh, early 90s. It was the um, Virtual Interface Environment Workstation, or VIEW. That's mm -hmm. a mouthful. <laughs> early VR, though, right? I mean, it looks right. something like a VR headset today. This is an early VR, and um, as you can see in the picture, um, there is a stereo head-mounted display, mm -hmm. and there are headphones, and there's a microphone, and there are data gloves that the wearer would be putting on. And so together, this would help um, provide a feeling of st stimulation for the senses, mm -hmm. and as well as also, um, having that environment sort of react to what the wearer was doing. The eye movements would be tracked by the optics, and the gestures would be, you know, would also be captured with these gloves so mm -hmm. that the person could really be manipulating the environment, and it would be moving as they moved with it, and also, um, yeah, so you really feel immersed. Yeah, yeah, okay. even back in the early versions. So cool. what's this that you brought out on the, on the table? So this is an example of a data glove ah, that's um, right. ah. from the yeah from the archive here. Cool. So um, <laughs> sort of stuffed like a fake hand. <laughs> I like it. That's super cool of them. Is this, now now I was just gonna say that, that it's cool that that worked that way even back then. But actually, I died a little bit inside when you said that that was from the '90s because I don't think the '90s are that long ago, and that picture <laughs> looks really really old. So I was a little bit sad there. But I have some comments and questions for you. Okay. okay. Uh, history rules, first of all. <laughs> that is true. Uh, nice hair, April. Thank you. And a question for you. What is your favorite artifact? Oh, oh. Can you choose? You is know, it possible? as a rule, um, I do not have favorites. Um, I, I, like I that's a good rule to live yeah, by. Yeah. I have a hard time with favorites. We do have a lot of fun stuff in the archive. If I can name a suite of artifacts that mm -hmm. I really enjoy, um, that would be, and I would probably spend way too much time talking about these, but they're... Um, Just give us a taste. What would it be? Okay, um, be category? before we had computer graphics and all this cool VR stuff, um, we used to hire artists to um, ah. to paint our concepts and to actually, by hand, oh, wow. um, provide the visuals for yeah. the technology we were developing and, you know, these missions we thought we wanted to be going on. And we can't follow our spacecraft with a camera to take a picture of what it's doing. and. If 
if we haven't discovered it yet, we don't really know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So we have these artist concepts. Yeah. So cool. there's an art collection, and it includes concepts from the 1970s of our notions of what um, space settlements would look like. I'm using that a chance to see some of them, and they are stunning. Oh, cool. And they're going to be on exhibit in 2019 Ooh. at a local museum here nice. in the Bay Area. Nice. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Okay, so, so I think we have more? another uh, Ames archive photo. So can we go ahead and get that brought up on screen? Uh -huh. So what's going on here? Okay, well, what we are looking at are um, human computers before, um, since we're talking about pre-computing sometimes, before we had <laughs> machine computing, we had to use humans um, along with their brain power and maybe some slide rules. Yeah. And so these women um, would have been working in a wind tunnel in the 1940s. And during World War II, a lot of women stepped up to fill these human computing roles. Um, and they would have had advanced degrees and a field like mathematics and what they would do is they would take all of this raw data during the war we were doing just like tons and tons of wind tunnel testing to try to help um, improve the stability and maneuverability and speed um, and handling characteristics of aircraft in the war effort and so all of this data pumping through these tunnels they would be collecting and reducing, and they would be performing complex calculations yeah. to um, make it into manageable engineering units. Right, so. right. I mean, this was this was far more than just purely secretarial work. Yeah. These, these these were uh, highly educated women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe so, if our sure. viewers at home wanted to recreate the look of a human computer, mm -hmm. what might we need? Well, I suppose you could, uh, if you're going for this era, you could go to a vintage clothing shop. Yeah. Uh, maybe carry a clipboard around mm -hmm. or a slide rule. I know, slide Definitely. rule. Definitely. You yeah. could, um, if you were very adventurous and, and skilled, you could do a 1940s hairstyle, Ooh. which they, yeah. there are very specific rules and a lot of different varieties that you can choose from. Or if you could also get it like a hairnet, also called a snood. Um, oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've heard of those, yeah. Cool. Oh, I, I did want to mention that we tried to find out the names of the women who oh, yeah. are, are okay. in this photograph, but we didn't have enough time. But there is a really great project uh, going on called the Human Computer Project, mm. and it's trying to identify all of the women scientists, engineers, and mathematicians uh, that worked for the NACA and at NASA. Yeah, nice, okay. very nice. And we have plenty of time to get into this stuff, so let me throw out some more questions. More love the purple-haired lady. <laughs> people are loving April and her stories. Um, April or Lane, is NASA using VR technology today as well? Is that something you guys track or? That's not something about? that, you know, in the archive, I'm looking more in the past. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, our human performance lab. Um, right. Or um, where the view was developed, the Human Systems Integration Division yes. uh, is maybe not looking necessarily into VR, but certainly related things. Okay. okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the next best thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The next version. Um, April, can can the public visit the archive? By appointment, um, you know, uh, the public can, can research in the archive. We do have oh, limited right. resources. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I do give tours. Okay. Um, and, you know, like it would be like, you know, maybe a whole class of students from the, you know, university okay. history students did come over. And so absolutely, I mean, part of the point of the archive is to make our history and these research materials accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, to whoever wants to use them. Typically, people um, have a research purpose yeah, um, when sense. they come into the archive, but of course, yes, yeah. and there are materials online. Cool. Yeah, uh, a few more. April, how long have you been working at NASA? I've been working at NASA, um, so, um, I guess, for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yes. All right, cool. <laughs> What about you, Lane? Um, yeah. Oh, me, I'm a relatively new addition. I'm uh, just about finishing up my first year. Okay. Yeah. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> it's all longer. I, I no, I remember when you arrived. It seemed like a year ago. Um, a couple things about the human computers. A comment, wow, imagine how time-consuming that mathematical <laughs> work they were doing. And did the women retain the roles they were in after World War II? 
So in some cases, um, well, if you're thinking, uh, yes, they were did stay in some of the positions and not necessarily were pushed out for men to come back into in, into these jobs. But um, not only that, but a lot of the women continued on at Ames after electronic computing and uh, were working with those machines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They, you know, they moved in and became computer programmers, basically. And one of the women, I don't think she started as a computer, a human computer, um, but Marcy Church Smith actually rose through the ranks and became the chief of the computing division. Oh, wow. Um, that's um, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, and that happened across the federal government. Like when you think about the Library of Congress and the machine cataloging, really? a lot of women were behind those efforts. Yeah. Nice to know. That's pretty cool. Cool. Should we go to our I next think, image? I think, I think we should. All right. So can we go ahead and get that up on screen? All right. Who do we have here, or what's and what is that? <laughs> yeah, right. standing in front of. So, so many elements here, right? Um, this is a, an F100 Super Saber. Um, this photo is from 1957, so it was the year before um, Ames became part of NASA, mm -hmm. when it was one of the aeronautical laboratories of the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Okay, right. Yeah. And a lot of the work that was done here at Ames was focused on uh, flight testing. And um, here uh, on this plane, you can see a, uh, well, rather large pitot tube. That's a boom sticking out from the front that hmm. measures airspeed. Okay. And you might also notice the swept back wings that were on the F-100. And that was a pretty recent development uh, the design of having uh, the wings swept back in that sort of way, which would reduce drag. And uh, R.T. Jones, who was at Langley but spent a lot of his career here at Ames, was one of the people who was responsible for promoting the swept wing design. Okay, Let's, so I think we have a street named after him on our yeah, campus. We do, don't we, we do. do. It's okay. right outside the Cooper front Loop. gates. <laughs> Never knew who he was. Oh, R.T. Jones. Jones. Sorry, George Cooper. Sorry. Is that, is that right. the pilot there? Who's the pilot that's shown in this uh, historical photo? The the pilot is um, one of our you know one of our most distinguished um, test pilots, yeah. George Cooper. Um, George Cooper started at Ames in 1945. Um, before which he served um, in the in World War II as a fighter pilot, okay. um, and um, among his many many accomplishments, um, um, he was also an engineer, and he developed the uh, a rating scale, a ten point rating scale, that pilots would use to be able to provide normalized and consistent information that they um, you know that they would gather while they were testing these aircraft hmm. and so you know it's just this way of like okay we're going to have metrics and we're okay. going to be consistent okay. and we're going to contribute aircraft to the performance or something yeah. aircraft performance and safety oh, yes. um, and um, it's actually still used as an international standard today mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. wow. what's it yeah. called again it's um like the cooper harper rating scale bill mm -hmm. harper i think helped him um bill harper charles it's pretty cool so um, Viewers at home, mm -hmm. if they wanted to recreate George Cooper's look over here, <laughs> what would we need? Well, <laughs> um, if we could see the, the, the photo again. That Can we get help. that brought up? Okay, um, I'm thinking some kind of helmet, um, perhaps some kind of backpack. I think mm -hmm. Lane thought that was a parachute. A parachute, um, probably. Yeah. And some work boots and coveralls. And, and it also depends if you uh, are thinking about which type of flight suit you want to be be wearing. Mm -hmm. um, this is more of a, a pressure sh a suit because the F-100 uh, was a, a supersonic uh, uh -huh. aircraft. And um, so if, and also flying at higher altitudes. So looser clothing could be worn in a, in a flight suit, just mm -hmm. okay. all depending. It depends on what altitude your Halloween costume <laughs> needs to fly at. <laughs> exactly. Is, is what I understand. <laughs> okay. So somebody wanted to check what the plane was called. It is the F-100, right? That's right. Okay. Um, speaking of how long people have worked at NASA, do you know what the longest serving employee of NASA is? Who it is or, or how long that tenure was? 
We would, we, one would assume um, Jack Boyd, um, but that wouldn't be oh, right if really? you're thinking of contiguous years. Oh, but, Jack um, Boyd our, is here. He works here at NASA Ames. Our boss, yeah. Jack Boyd, oh. um, started at Ames when it was NACA in 1947, wow. and he has served under every single center director since the beginning. Oh. Um, he's in wow. his early 90s. He still comes into the center three days a week. Yep very active in, in uh, things going on at Ames and very supportive of the history office. Yes, and a testament to um, why it might not be a good idea to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so the longest serving NASA employees have been here for decades and decades. Yeah, That's fantastic. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That is cool. Job uh, satisfaction. Yeah. Um, a few comments. Well, Lane, a question. Is the NASA library only textbooks or does it contain creative work as well? Interesting. Uh, NASA library meaning perhaps the archive. Oh, uh, um, um, there is a difference people. between libraries and archives. We okay. do have two libraries, um, two main libraries at Ames, a technical library and a life sciences library. Mm -hmm. They focus on published materials okay. and, um, you know, assist with research queries, um, you know, through this public published materials, mm -hmm. whereas the archive tends, archives tend to focus on more unique uh, materials and collections mm -hmm. of um, so whatever it is. Letters, correspondence, oh, okay. um, yeah. early drafts of, of their work. Okay. okay. Let's see. Uh, data designs. Yeah. Um, quick comment before we go to our next image. It's so amazing, all those old pictures. I love it. Somebody appreciates <laughs> your historical stuff here and uh, and a tip for everyone at home if you want to recreate that flight suit outfit salad bowl for the oh, helmet wow. <laughs> okay. huh. <That's> <laughs> that could work yeah okay. <laughs> so let's move along to our next image that we have from Ames Okay. This is pretty unique. Like, yeah, I don't think yeah. I've ever seen something like this before. I, I just love these photos. Um, <laughs> this is um, what we're seeing is the AX3, which is one of a series of Ames experimental hard, um, hard bodied spacesuits. Um, the man we're seeing is Vic Vacucol, and I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his name. So I'm probably butchering it. Um, and he was very instrumental in testing and designing these suits. So um, what you can see where there's sort of joints, these suits were made to be very flexible. They were meant to be worn in EVA or extravehicular activities mm -hmm. where space um, astronauts go outside of the ship or the station. Yeah. And um, they are able to withstand all kinds of hazards flying past them like meteoroids. Um, not to be confused with asteroids, okay. that would be a problem. <laughs> Is that bigger? <laughs> a little bit bigger? Okay. Um, I mean, and in contrast to the uh, really iconic Apollo era suits, mm -hmm. the A7L, which look and were constructed largely of fabric, even though there were hard components, mm -hmm. you might think that those suits would be more flexible than a hard suit. Yeah. But this hard suit was extremely maneuverable, okay. and I, I even read that uh, there, within that suit you have 95% maneuverability as you do when you're naked. Okay, for our viewers at home, please don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Out. That's pretty good for a spacesuit. Yeah, I'm having trouble imagining that. But that, that's a super weird fun fact, and I that enjoy is. knowing that. So speaking we of that, we can count on Lane for that. If you yeah. wanted to recreate this at home, minus the 95% maneuverability while you're naked, right? Right. Uh, what might we do? This is a really difficult one for me, and um, clearly I'm not the right person to be, be asking <laughs> to, to how to put together a Halloween costume, but we were thinking maybe um, some kind of uh, duct tape to be showing exactly where the different components would, would be removed. I mean, something that and these suits were never used, but um, what made them so, so, such an improvement was their flexibility and the fact that they were modular so they could be taken apart easily right. okay. and uh, maintained. So there could be some kind of element that's showing, the, you know, that kind of red duct tape. Thing, that's you know? a great yeah. idea. You could put on some knee pads, you could have a do rag, uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and if you couldn't mm -hmm. quite pull off the helmet, you could 
sort of have something to the side. Um, Holding your helmet. Yeah. Fishbowl. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Right. So, um, <laughs> so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next archive photo. Okay. Um, While we bring can, that up, can, can I just share that people want that for their costume? <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> right. Uh, th this one is actually my, my favorite. This is... What uh, is this? I'm just going to look at it. For the normal Halloween costume. <laughs> right. You're going to... You're daring. Uh, by all means, uh, recreate the liquid cooling and ventilation garment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a, a, a later version from the, the 90s, but these suits have been used for a very long time. And what they have are tubes throughout the garment that have cool liquid uh, flowing through them and then go back into a heat exchanger and the water is cooled again and then put back through the suit. And this is all to keep the astronaut's uh, body temperature regulated. Okay. Okay. So you can wear this underneath the space suit when you're in EVA and you know you're doing a lot of work and you're you're sweating mm -hmm. and you know you need to be able to stay cool so that's what this garment does uh the ventilation aspect of it um, is, if you can see the material is a bit porous is mm -hmm. to uh bring the sweat away from the astronaut's body okay uh -huh. That's yeah. actually pretty cool. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like your undergarment for your space suit. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they were also called union suits after the long underwear with the flap in the back. Yes. <laughs> so, and if you're too shy to be wear, if you want to be somewhat risque, but you don't want to go for the sheer white underwear on Halloween, they did come in different colors. Okay. So, <laughs> they did. Good to know. And, uh, and then later versions were made more spandex. This one was kind of an elastic fabric, but. Um, Maybe a wetsuit would also work for, right. for, for yeah. recreating this oh, yeah. as well. I mean, what I think is so fascinating about these garments is that they've been used far beyond NASA and right. are worn by race car drivers, uh, yeah. firefighters, um, surgeons who are doing long operations. Oh, wow. That's actually pretty cool. And uh, my favorite one is, um, and I never thought of this, but it makes total sense. If you go to a theme park and you see someone wearing like one of those huge oh. furry animal costumes, oh, yeah. yes. especially if you're someplace hot, they'll wear one of these. Uh, liquid cooling garments underneath. Oh, that's hilarious. Yes. That's and actually it, really cool. I never thought about mm -hmm. that. That's and it awesome. was, and then, and I'm, there were, these were developed all over, um, throughout different centers, but there was actually a British physician who was the first person who said that maybe we should use liquid cooling instead of air or gas ventilation oh, to yeah. accomplish this. And uh, he came into came over to the NASA in the 60s and uh, then to Ames. Uh, mm -hmm. This was, his name was John Billingham. And he's very important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, in addition to, to uh, thinking of this idea, he was the, he's known as the father of SETI at NASA and- uh, Search for extraterrestrial intelligence, right, really? Exactly. Oh, well, he, yeah. he did it all. in the astrobiology <laughs> community and I met him. Oh, that's <laughs> pretty cool. A lot of George Cooper, I forgot to mention. Oh, I got nice. to meet George Cooper. Lots of, lots of games, folks. Right, you need all the stars as an archivist, I guess. <laughs> Very right. cool. Okay, well, thank you, thank April you so and Lane, for joining yeah, us. That, that was fascinating. And, uh, joining us on this trip down memory lane. <laughs> And so don't forget for our viewers on Twitch, if you do end up using any of these looks or wear any space themed costumes, uh, we want to see it. So you can go ahead and share your NASA inspired costumes on social media using the hashtag NASA costume. Sweet. Check Abby. it out, Danielle. Abby, what is going on over here? I found more exoplanets, more of them. I just keep finding them. Kepler found some really cool planets. Like, for instance, one of my favorites is planets around double star systems. Ah. So for you Star Wars fans, that means double sunsets do exist, like on Tatooine. What? So it's just one of the many things that our Kepler mission found out about the galaxy. That is pretty cool. That exciting? is definitely pretty cool. So let's go ahead and move right on to our final category. Oh, I'm right. sure this is going to be a fan favorite. We're talking NASA-inspired cosplay costumes. Sweet. <laughs> so these are cosplay costumes, of course, with the NASA twist. So let's go ahead and welcome our first guest to the set. Mm -hmm. Come on out. Um, Robert. Robert. Hey, hey, yes, the force is strong with this one. This is Robert as a Jedi in training. Hey. Oh, uh, training, that's it? Well, you're, you're almost there. You're almost there. <laughs> Have I not learned? <laughs> 
<laughs> You're about to graduate. Oh, cool. That's what I Is this the interview for it? <laughs> That's right. Oh, great. Oh. Well, welcome, Robert. So, uh, first things first, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do here at Ames. Uh, okay, so my name is Robert, and I have worked here at NASA Ames for five years now. Uh, I'm a systems engineer, and what that means is we work, uh, our team works on spacecraft and satellite, uh, kind of on like a system, subsystem level, uh, where we get to kind of make things, uh, test things, oftentimes break things, and then <laughs> the figure part. out why they broke and maybe how to prevent that in the future before it goes up into space. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, and so wait. speaking of space, like, what have you got over here? Okay. So this bad boy is called SPHERES. Uh, it stands for Synchronize, Position, Hold, Engage, Reorient, Experimental Satellites. Uh, it's a mouthful. Yeah, it is yeah. a mouthful. Uh, Let's say spheres. And mo most of the time, we, we can't remember the acronym either. Um, there are currently two of them on station, and they are used for conducting control theory experiments Whoa. and uh, okay. Okay, so things first, like that. So this guy, guys like this are on the International Space yes, Station. Yes, there are two identical to this, different okay. colors. We actually denote them by their colors. There is uh, a blue one and a red one currently mm -hmm. up there. You know, I think we have some footage yes, of that definitely. on the space station. Can we go ahead and get that? Oh, yeah, so this is uh, actually the astronaut on the right is Scott Kelly, uh, the guy who was up there for a little over a year. This was a previous mission that he had done, um, and this is kind of a, a really good example to understand. So they are um, doing just a simple maneuver, well, not as simple as it appears, where one is rotating uh, by around itself, and then the other one is rotating around that one in a different pattern. Oh, so that's just sort of a, a basic example of, of what these things are capable of. But yeah. there's so much more that they can do. Um, and that's kind of with the help of the expansion port right here. That has allowed for uh, numerous payloads and sciences to be added onto spheres to do way more things that we maybe never thought was possible with the original design of spheres. So it's really cool to see that over 10 years that this thing has is sort of exploded and, and we've got something like over 300 uh, crew hours on station oh, in the last okay. 10 years. Which is it's I don't know if impressive. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's the, the the most, but it's definitely up there with more than most. And uh, we're still going strong. Um, we have a test session next week, as a matter of fact. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I've heard these help do experiments. Is that true? Yeah. So what kind of experiments? So uh, when we want to do or practice control theory for spacecraft or other rockets in a zero gravity environment. Uh, can be very daunting to to immediately send something up there and not oh, sure, have yeah. practiced and mm -hmm. gotten the math right because uh, that's always important so uh, what these guys allow for is really basic testing uh, well well within the constraints of the International Space Station it's always crew attended um, but ultimately these things are able to validate and verify a lot of algorithms and and ideas and new sensors that they can maybe implement on larger spacecraft to mm -hmm. avoid okay. colliding with each other or that they can more accurately dock with the space station or uh, really the, the big punchline is reconfigurable spacecraft in in orbit or if you're going to the moon and you want to build some kind of station around it you have to have multiple parts come together uh, if you've got things that can autonomously do that uh, and, and sort of connect everything together. It's a lot safer, so you don't have to have astronauts doing it, and it's much more automated. So this, this sort of helps validate a lot of that, but, in, um, but at a much cheaper cost, because you already have these things in the space station, so all you have to do is just reprogram it to do whatever you, you want, and, and you yeah. can try it out, and if it doesn't work so good, then you can try something else, and, okay. and without a very uh, high price uh, yeah. point, so. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, that makes sense. So, Come. Abby, do we have any questions? Well, we do. Here's, here's an important one to okay. start us off. Robert? Luke or Yoda? Luke. Oh, I'm, a, I'm, a, oh, I'm a Mark ooh. Hamill fan, but okay. i got to support <laughs> Frank Oz, too. So. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hesitate at all, <laughs> no, no. I must say. I say the Force was strong with this one. I'd like to think so. <laughs> yes. Who shot first? Han. <laughs> We're not even, that, that question is not. Moving on. Okay. I will not dignify that yeah. for the next. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if our viewers wanted to recreate... The look. Not only the look, but also spheres. What might we do? Okay, so uh, for the the uh, wonderful Jedi garb, uh, you could start with something as simple as like a bathrobe with a hood and kind of yeah. work your way up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you could get just a lot of fabric and sew it yourself. Uh, the cool thing is, like Jedi outfits are very like undefined oftentimes, and so it's kind of like creator choice you know you can get okay. you can find robes and pajamas <laughs> and if you put enough sashes and belts on it it, it looks star wars it'll pass oh and then if you wanted to create one of these bad right. boys yeah so uh 
we actually have a wooden one uh, in our lab that we use as a mass analog. It weighs identically to it, uh, and dimensionally it's the same. Um, we cut it with a bandsaw and glued it together. Uh, so you could do that and just paint it black or whatever magical color you could think yeah, of. Yeah, cool. Did you say, and is it true, that this inspired? Yes. So there, uh, the the story goes, and and, and maybe that's the, the true reason why I'm, I'm <laughs> representing our, our Jedi brethren is uh, <laughs> yes. the, the story behind Spears was uh, Dave Miller, who is a professor at MIT, who was also chief technologist at Ames a few years ago, um, had one of his senior projects, uh, and he showed the clip in A New Hope, of Jedi or of, of Luke uh, practicing with the little droid floating around, hitting him with the blaster, and he told him to put the face shield down, and and Han's like, I don't believe in the Force and all that that fun stuff, uh, and he showed that clip to his students, and he said, I want you to make me one of those, and that's that's what they did, is they they you know as as best they could, and it's it's not spherical, ironically it is called spheres, <laughs> yeah. um, but it uh, it was a very uh, strong effort from a bunch of students at MIT that put this thing together like 10, 12, 15 years ago. And the thing still works great, and so yeah, it, it is Star Wars inspired. We can we can that is put pretty cool. Back on that one. Is. That's great. <laughs> so. Excellent. Okay, right. so well, I think we have time for one quick question. Okay. Well, Spheres is neat. Is a comment we got. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, NASA.gov slash spheres. Check it out. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll also put that in the uh, the chat Twitch. The Twitch chat? Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Right. Well, right. thank you, Robert. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's go mm -hmm. ahead and welcome our next guest. So what would you do if you have a bunch of robo bees in space? Uh, you're going to need an astro beekeeper. So let's go ahead and welcome out uh, Rick as astro beekeeper and Maria. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 I've been looking forward to seeing the Astro Beekeeper. Hello, Rick. Hello. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> okay, so starting us off, so uh, Maria, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, I'm Maria Bullet, um, and I'm the project manager for the Astro Bee project. Excellent. So we are building these free-flying robots for the International Space Station. Thank you. Yeah, hold it up there. So these are just some uh, 3D printed models of it. Um, and it's actually, this is a one-third scale. So it's actually 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 okay. inches. Oh, all right. So yeah, it's a yeah. little bit bigger than what you see here. What does Astro B do? Um, it will fly around on the International Space Station. Okay. It's actually going to replace the spheres, oh, which Robert ah. just talked about. Mm -hmm. So. Spheres, they've been a great payload. They've been up there for over 10 years. Wow, um, okay. And they are starting to show their age. Um, uh, the thrusters don't work quite as well. Oh. And, you know, the processor is outdated. So um, Astro B mm -hmm. is going to replace them. We're going to fly three of them. Um, and it's got more processing power. Um, it's a little easier to interface other payloads onto. Okay. So these are payload bays here on the bottom and one on the top where you can just plug in another payload with different sensors. Okay, yeah, uh, like yeah. some instrument to measure. Exactly. Or yeah. uh, you can measure carbon dioxide on oh, board okay. or radiation, oh, um, sounds. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, and then we also um, will act as a flying instrument or flying camera. So okay. ground controllers um, can actually fly the robot around, and there's a high-definition camera on it, so they can actually observe crew activities. So crew doesn't have to actually place a camera. The, the, okay. the ground controllers just fly up so there. So the crew can take all of the selfies that they want. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there's That's actually the goal here, there's a, there is a touch screen on the front also, so the crew can also interact with the robot. Oh, cool. Okay. So, so you mentioned they're flying aboard the uh, the International Space Station. How many of them are going to be? Are there going to be three? There will be three on board. Mm -hmm. um, we also ha will have three ground units, so we can okay. test everything out on the ground before we fly it. Okay, do they have any creative names? They do, with the bee they, they are color coded um, and they have nicknames. So they are all Astro Bees. Okay. Right? But they each have a, a name. So um, Honey is yellow. Okay. Bumble is blue and Queen is green. All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that Maybe. way we can tell them apart. You know, when we're uh, looking at video on station, crew can tell them apart. They say, oh, 
queen stuck to a event. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, yeah. rescue queen. But and you so. know, I think do we have we have some animation. We have a couple of images. So yeah. can we go ahead and bring that up on screen? Let's see the real deal. Astrobe. Yes. So this is this is a computer animation of what uh, Astrobe will look like on station. So there's a green one. So that must be Queen. Um, and as I said, it can uh, can run different experiments. So here it's using its manipulator to uh, to grab something or perhaps even move cargo. So we have two of them working, uh, cooperating, oh, wow. have okay. one uh, pulling and one pushing. So that was uh, that was blue in the back there. So that must have been Bumble helping okay, along. Yeah. So. Here's a question that I'm wondering, too. How does it fly on the space station? So it's... Um, when you look at it, it's kind of, we call it, it's sort of like a hamburger, right? Except it flies mm -hmm. this way. Um, and each of the, the buns is a propulsion module. Um, <laughs> and there is an impeller, a fan, basically, that pulls air in. So this only works inside the okay. space station. It won't okay. work outside. Um, so it pulls air in and lightly pressurizes the propulsion module. And then on each face, there's a nozzle and then two here on the, on the ends. So we can fly in any direction yeah, and rotate okay. around any axis. So that's how it how it flies. How oh, cool! That's actually pretty and it, cool. the way it navigates is there are cameras in the front, and it uses its navigation camera to uh, it sees uh, features, just natural textures, visual textures in the space station. It builds a map and then compares what it sees to its map, so it knows where it is. Ah, so I would say it's almost bee like. Yes, <laughs> and, it, and it buzzes because it's got fans. Well, it's got fans going right, oh, so yeah. it's got a little bit of a buzz to it. So that's how it became known as Astro Bee. Oh, really? All right. And hopefully, we'll be busy as a bee on there. Oh, yes. good point. That's good point. It all comes together. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Rick. Hey, how's it going there? <laughs> Pretty good. good. Thanks for demoing oh, Astro Beekeeper. My pleasure. <laughs> Always wanted to be a. Astro beekeeper. Well, who hasn't? <laughs> I mean, we've all dreamt of that. So, Rick, where do you land on the Luke or Yoda question? On the on the what? Luke or Yoda? Yoda. And also, Yoda has hair coming out of his ears. Like, <laughs> what a great what great character design! Come on. <laughs> what a great character design. Fabulous. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, Rick and Maria. It's been a pleasure having you guys on the show, but. We are going to see you a little bit later because we have to vote on our costumes. Yeah. Very nice. Beekeeper. Costume. That's right. All right. Thanks so, for being on. Thank so you. for our viewers on Twitch, don't forget you guys can vote for your favorite con uh, your favorite costumes. And if you do end up using any of these NASA-inspired cosplay or any space theme, you can go ahead and tag us on our social media ch channels. Hashtag NASA costume. Yeah. I'm going to go check that out after this. <laughs> <laughs> See what's up there. <laughs> All right. So next up, everybody knows Mary Poppins, right? So our NASA version is Mary Techno Poppins with some innovative NASA heat shield technology that they're going to tell us about. So come on out, Paul. And Roxana. And, and Roxana. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you are adorable. So why don't you guys go ahead and come on up. Join us up on up here so cute and i love your umbrella thank you so <laughs> if you guys can introduce yourself and let us know what you do here at ames um my name is paul Worsinski. uh i'm a aerospace engineer currently the project manager for adept and uh we've been working on uh, heat shields at ames here for for quite a long while, and this is our latest uh, generation of a, a new type of heat shield. Okay, so you mentioned ADEPT. Yes. What is that? Because I know there's an acronym for everything. Of course. <laughs> there is. Uh, ADEPT stands for Adaptable, Deployable, Entry, and Placement Technology. So ah. it is a mouthful. Uh, the way we describe it is just with the umbrella analogy. It's uh, <laughs> It stows on the ground or in your launch vehicle, and before it gets to a planet, it opens up to do its job as a heat shield. Okay, and you know, I think we have some footage of ADEPT. Okay. So can we go ahead and get that brought on oh, screen? Yeah. That's it opening up, huh? Yes, the, this is the lab here at Ames, uh, and there's uh, some of the early prototypes uh, just going through uh, deployment. And here you're seeing the arc jets also here at Ames. Those are the best facilities for simulating the high heating uh, rates that a probe or a heat shield will see when it's flying into a planet's surface. And there's yeah. one of the adepts in there glowing red hot. 
I was going to say, why don't you remind us actually what, what is what, it about heat shields? What, what are they used for and why are they necessary? Sure. Uh, well, heat shields for any vehicle going to Mars, putting the rovers down, mm -hmm. um, astronauts returning back to Earth, all kinds of things. If you're flying through a planet's atmosphere, you need a heat shield to protect your payload from burning up okay. or else you would end up like a meteorite or something. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, okay, so we don't want to leave yeah. Roxana left out. So yeah. please tell me a little bit about what you get, what you do here at Ames. Um, so yes, my name is Roxana, and um, what I do is the travel regionalization with Armstrong and deployments uh, campaign here at Ames. Okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. So you talked a little bit about entry. So what exactly? What is Adept hope to solve? Up to now, we've been uh, building heat shields, which we call rigid heat shields. So basically, they're a big saucer-like dish okay. uh, covered with special materials, ablative materials, and those um, are made to survive the high heating during entry. And those have worked very well. We've used them successfully. Um, but what we are seeing um, now is other missions where these heat shields uh, that we need to satisfy a mission needs to be even bigger than what even our largest rockets that we're designing right now can carry. Okay. And so that's the whole motivation behind uh, this umbrella concept of stowing, because it can now be in a smaller shape mm -hmm. and then actually open up to a size much bigger than mm. what the rocket could have accommodated. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, it's more flexible for different sized vehicles and spacecraft. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, okay, cool. people have conceived uh, these. This is a, a smaller version. This is just under a meter in diameter, but uh, uh, the engineers have uh, looked at designs up to 16, 18 meters in diameter. Oh, wow. Think about that uh, for delivering a large, almost like a, a small house to the surface of Mars well, for human exploration. You need wow. a heat shield that big. Okay. And when you think about that, that's you can't fit that in a rocket yeah. as it is. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So if people want to know what it's made of, what is this fabric? Ah, that's a great question. Um, that's essentially the enabling technology with ADEPT. And this is a, a three-dimensional woven carbon fabric. It's made from pure carbon yarn. Um, and carbon is a great material for high temperature applications. Carbon can survive very high temperatures and still retain its properties. And that's what we're looking for in this heat shield. Cool. Okay. Uh, more questions. Uh, how much temperature can it withstand versus traditional heat shields? Uh, it's about the same temperature that a regular heat shield would see. It's uh, in excess of three, even 3,500 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. That's very high. You saw it glowing red hot in that, in that video. Yeah. So that's the big challenge is not only does this fabric have to stow and open up like an umbrella and take on the pressures, it's going to get really hot and still have to hold together. Yeah. Uh, speaking of holding together, somebody is thinking it must be very strong to deploy while entering the atmosphere. Uh, what What's the trick that? we do is um, the deployment actually takes place um, in our mission designs uh, literally days before it enters the planet. So it opens up uh -huh. um, okay. before you enter the atmosphere, so you're not seeing all the forces that it sees when it's flying through the atmosphere. It's opened up, locked into place, gives you time even to check it out to make sure it's it's uh, the way you want it to be. Then you're ready to go into the planet, surf, uh, okay. go to the planet and do the mission. Okay, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you both Paul and Roxana. And Roxana, I do have to say your outfit is very super catcher fragilistic <laughs> expert NASA doshes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank you. <laughs> it's really fun incorporating this. <laughs> Excellent. So you'll never look at your work the same again, I think. No, but, I probably uh, no. won't. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank, well, you guys. thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll circle back with you guys a little bit later when right. we go ahead and vote on our costumes. So everyone is fans of Loki from the Avengers. So we are going to go ahead and welcome, welcome our own version. We call her low budget Loki. So let's go ahead and come on out, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> 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 nice twirl. Excellent. Nice. <laughs> Fabulous. Come on, Come on up. Okay, so please introduce yourself and tell us what it is you do here at Ames. Yeah, so my name is uh, Liz Hyde, and uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, a uh, contractor here at Ames Research Center, working on small sets. 
It's a pretty snazzy crown that you've got going on there. Well done. Well done. Did you yeah. make that yourself? Yeah, I knocked this out last night <laughs> watching the baseball game. <laughs> See, NASA engineers. Okay, at work so can do it all. you mentioned a small satellite. Like, what is yes. that? Uh, so it's literally a small satellite. So this is a one-to-one scale model um, of a CubeSat specifically. So small sats are, you know, kind of done by size, mm-hmm. but CubeSats are a very specific standardized kind of Mm-hmm. I think Thanks. we have an image of that. Can we go ahead and get that brought up on screen? Yeah, so that's an image of a CubeSat, just like the one I have on the table here. And so the key is that this is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of to keep things standardized. And if you wanted to make it bigger, you could stack more of these cubes on top of each other. So, yeah, so you could have a 1U, 2U, 3U. Oh, yes. A lot of stuff we're doing now is on, like, the 6U level. I'm sorry to pose things bigger than that on the 12U level just Ooh. to pack more things into a box. Like it's science experiments or yeah, tech exactly. or something? Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the stuff, um, CubeSats are kind of very popular nowadays sort of all over industry, both in the private sector and in education. Okay. And sort of at cool. NASA what we're trying to do is just kind of be on the cutting edge of that. Um, so doing new, like, Propulsion technology, doing science experiments is what we do a lot here at Ames. Uh, biology experiments are kind of our yeah. bread and butter <laughs> when it comes to the small satellite payloads. Very cool. So what would be a benefit of building a CubeSat as opposed to a larger satellite? Yeah, so it, it really comes down to taking advantage of what we have given to us. Mm-hmm. So if you think if you have like a big, like you have Falcon 9 launch and they're launching a big satellite. There's all this extra room sort of at the bottom that's not being used, and we can fill in that space and put a bunch of these CubeSats there and just kind of tag along for the ride. So it's, you know, getting opportunities that we wouldn't normally have. Okay, so it's almost like you're low budget, kind of like low this uh, costume that you're <laughs> rocking over here. Exactly. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah, I feel that even I could throw together a Loki t-shirt, but I don't yes. know if I could make the helmet. And your costume has become an instant favorite on the show. Also, so for all of you Marvel fans out there, the opening scene from the Avengers when Loki is stealing the Tesseract, that was filmed at our NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio. Very so cool. That's yeah, how we can facts. tie this whole theme together. Yeah. I think we're, we're almost going to have to let you go. But, so a quick so question. Good. Would yes. th- a satellite like that be launched from the space station? Absolutely. Um, yeah. There is a, you know, a couple different ways that when we at NASA have launched satellites from the space station, they have a deployer up there. So it's really wherever we can deploy these from. It's at the space station, if it's a separate rocket, mm-hmm. um, sort of whoever will give us a ride, you know, yeah, okay. we'll go for a ride. Yeah, and they're okay. so small that there are more options maybe. Exactly. And yeah. that's sort of how, you know, you're, you're saving money also oh, as yeah. well. All right. Awesome. Well, low thank budget you. Loki. Thank you, low budget Loki. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Fabulous. So, who's up next? I'm excited for this one, I gotta say. What if the old man from Up worked at NASA? Ever ask yourself that? I do. I've, I've been wondering for a long time. So, let's say hi to Lab Coat Carl. Come on out, Samantha. Come on out. Oh, yes. <laughs> Welcome. So cute. Hello, ladies. Welcome, Carl. Samantha. Thank you. Excellent. So tell us your name and a little about what you do. I am Dr. Samantha Waters, and I work in the uh, aerobiology lab here Mm -hmm. at NASA Ames on exposing microorganisms in the stratosphere, or EMIST. Okay. Mist experiments. Excellent. Yes. yes, I got to write about this one, so I've heard about this a bit. But tell us, what's the deal? Mike. So, at the border of planetary protection and the search for extraterrestrial life, we want to look at extreme microorganisms. And we can take them for a ride okay. on balloons. You know, I think we have an image of Ooh, yes. one of the balloons that you guys use. So can okay. we get that? Right. So not those balloons. <laughs> but yes. <one> of these. <laughs> not the balloons you can get at your local grocery store, but a balloon filled with helium. So this is at ground level. You can see a small human to the left of the balloon for scale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at ground level, it's about 100 feet tall wow, wow, okay. as it goes up and the external pressure is less than the internal pressure it can actually expand out to the size of a stadium 
Wow. So, wow. Very large. large. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that is going to travel, if I recall the title of this article I worked on, 19 <laughs> miles up. <laughs> it goes, it yes. <laughs> really high in the atmosphere, right? Yes. It goes up past the troposphere, which is where the majority of all Earth life is found, and into the stratosphere, where we actually do sample living microbes from the stratosphere okay. that have been blown up there due to storm systems oh, and such. Okay. So how might you go about doing that? Uh, sampling them or sampling. taking uh, the balloons up? <laughs> uh, sampling. <laughs> so the balloons don't sample. The balloons, we actually add microorganisms on these little aluminum plates. Uh, yes, or wait, I have coupons. one. I have one. I have yes. never seen one of these before. Yes, they're but very tiny, and you can even fit them in your looks, pocket. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it looks like a dog tag, maybe. It does look like a dog tag. So they're aluminum, they're thin, and we can spot microorganisms on them, such as in the photo. And oh, okay, then take yeah. them up for a ride on these balloons and expose them to all of the harsh environmental insults in the stratosphere. And those insults are actually one-on-one uh, -on -one in line with what uh, microorganisms would experience on the Martian surface. Oh, on okay. Mars. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's Earth's atmosphere standing in for yes. Mars conditions. Yes. The, uh, on Earth, the stratosphere is actually the best Mars analog. Oh, that's so, so cool. we can experiment there for long term in the Antarctic on with these balloons for upwards of two months. Oh, cool. Wow. Yes. wow. So how might our viewers at home recreate this amazing Carl ensemble that you've got going on over I'm here? I'm pretty sure you can go to your local thrift store and get a bow tie and a white shirt and a medical supply store will give you any kind of color lab coat you could want, pink, red, blue. And yeah. then some goggle or some glasses without <gasps> any lenses in them and a wig. Fabulous. <laughs> you look great. So are you going to wear this on Halloween, in fact? Uh, I will actually be at a conference <laughs> over Aww. in the D.C. area, and I will be dressed up as a witch with some skulls around. Okay. Ooh, so, nice. yes, that is how... I will freak out all of my fellow scientists. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Samantha. Thank, thank you, you for having me. <laughs> we'll see you in a bit. Okay, so... A good night of sleep is important in space, and thanks to our researchers here at Ames, the, our astronauts are alert and ready for a full day aboard the International Space Station. So let's say hi to Olivia as alert astronaut, and Erin, come on out. Yeah, oh, there she is. Hello, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> Wake up, astronauts. <laughs> well, you look well rested. Oh. <laughs> And Welcome. I've got to hear more about Thank this. Hey. So, ladies, tell me, uh, first introduce yourselves and tell me a little bit about what you do here. Hey, so, I'm Erin Flynn Evans. I'm a circadian physiologist and I lead the Fatigue Countermeasures Laboratory here. And this is Olivia. Yeah, my name is Olivia. Um, I'm a research assistant in Erin's lab. I help out with a lot of sleep related projects. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, why fatigue countermeasures? So it's funny, you think, well, I go to bed every night and I have no problem sleeping. Why would we need to study this in space? But actually, there are a lot of challenges associated with sleeping in space. Firstly, the astronauts are free floating. And mm -hmm. so we have to have um, uh, ways to keep them sort of strapped down so that they can sleep in one place. Yeah. Um, they're also going around the Earth every 90 minutes. And so they don't get a light dark cycle like we get here on okay. Earth. Um, we're very tied to our solar day and night. And so when it's night, it's not just a social cue for us to go to sleep, but we actually have a biological cue to go to sleep. And the astronauts don't have that in space. And it's going to be even worse when we go to Mars because the Mars day is a little bit longer than the Earth day. Mm. And so astronauts will have to be able to adapt to that slightly longer than 24 hour day. Yeah. And so we do research to figure out how they can do that. Excellent. You know, cool. I think we have some video. Do we? Of an experiment, of an experiment. in your lab, I guess? <laughs> yes. So this is an example of the type of experiment that we do in the lab. Um, there's, we are a sleep lab, but most people don't actually sleep in our sleep lab. Uh, we study sleep deprivation typically because most of the populations that we study often have to stay awake for extended periods of time. So we bring them in, we put them in bed, and then we keep them awake for 30 to 50 hours oh. and give them lots and lots of tests and measure their brain activity. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to take part in that or not. Yeah. It sounds interesting, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> but it'd be better to learn about it from you guys. Right. <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one quick question. Well, I want to just know a little bit about this like, cap and all the wires. What are you measuring with yeah, that? Yeah, so this is um, an EEG cap, um, and so we're measuring brain activity. So when we strap the cap on to astronauts or people here on the ground, uh, we can study how alert they are, and we can also um, figure out whether their quality of sleep mm. is good okay. to determine whether or not they'll perform well when we have them do tasks. All right. Sweet. Mm. Well, well, thank awesome you. Costume. Like, thank you. Oh. So I think we are going to say thank you yeah. for having you join us, ladies. But yeah. don't go too far because we do need to vote on our costumes. Right. So you can pop out there and get in line, and then we're going to bring everybody back out. So our viewers can vote. Okay, so uh -huh. we're going to go ahead and bring out all of our cosplay contestants. So here is another look at all of our cosplay costumes. So up first, we've got Robert as our Jedi no longer in training. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we've got Rick as Astro Beekeeper. We've got Roxana as our Mary Techno Poppins. I think we need to squeeze a little further. We've got Liz as our low budget Loki. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Olivia as our Astro Astronaut. Or, I'm sorry, our Alert Astronaut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Take a look. Put your votes in the chat. Who's so, Abby, be? I think, do we have a winner? I don't know. I don't know if I can decide. All right, it's gonna be the Astro Beekeeper! <laughs> <laughs> An Astro Bee. Outstanding. Just show us, just show us what you got. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, thank you Excellent. for all of our cosplayers for joining us on on our Twitch show today. And also, don't forget, if you do end up using any of these looks or wear any NASA space-themed costumes for Halloween, we want to see it. So make sure you tag us in all of your social channels. Hashtag NASA costume. <laughs> so, Abby, it looks like you guys, you've... I found so many exoplanets. Do you see them? So Kepler, in the end, taught us that there are more planets than stars. So I'm wearing as many as I could right now, just because I'm so excited about exoplanets. So I'm ready for Halloween. I think you are. All so right. um, I just want to say thank you. This has been NASA in Silicon Valley Live, a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center with the various scientists, researchers, and all around cool folks here at NASA, where we talk about all of your NASA nerdy news that you need to know about. And if you like that, you can find us on Twitch, on YouTube, Facebook, and NASA TV. And if you can't watch us live, no big deal. We have all of our video on demand after the show is over. And you can catch the audio version um, on podcast services throughout the solar system and beyond. And I do want to give a huge thank you to everyone that joined us um, on the Twitch chat. We'll be back on Thursday, November 8th, where we... We'll be celebrating National STEM Day right. with a bunch of amazing NASA women. Can't wait. So on I'll that see you note, there. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm out. Oh, that's right. I'm out. Listen up the chat. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>